Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I am the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you, Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about helping people with hearing loss is because I lost my brother Robbie twice. First to hearing loss from his radiation to his brain tumor and then when he passed away. I'm an ear, nose and throat doctor, but I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many more with hearing loss. I'm also the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center and I've written a book by the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you wanna learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, I'm excited. We have a great guest. Um, it's uh, Mr. Keith Lewis. He's a consultant who leverages over 40 years of marketing, sales, and general management and know-how in the medical space with competencies in marketing assessment, commercialization, new-to-market technologies, and he helps young professionals. He's worked extensively in the hearing loss space and hearing care, and he's going to share his his uh, insights into the market and uh, the current uh, status of the hearing care market. Hey, thanks for coming on with us. Hey, no problem. Glad to be here. So, so um, you know, we always want to know, like, you know, uh, at one point uh, you weren't uh, necessarily, um, uh, Keith, you weren't necessarily in the hearing space. So yeah. how did you end up there? And I know in the uh, pre-war, you said uh, you you, you, uh, uh, you started out in eyeballs and you changed to a different sensory organ. So um, yeah. tell me a little yeah. bit about your... your uh, well, I've always been passionate around medical devices. Uh, I started out, as I said, in vision, function, long, contact lenses, um, LASIK surgery, pharmaceuticals, you know, it, that there's something to be said for the nobility of some of these industries. Um, sure. uh, I just didn't have the passion to uh, market Doritos. Uh, so that's why I always fell in love with, with, with medical device. Well, the outcomes are great, right? So, right. That's, I mean, you know, it, when you, when, when you see that somebody has benefited from your products and or services, it, it, it's a nice feeling. Uh, it truly is. Um, but, you know, like anything else, 21 years in the industry, felt that I pretty much played that out. Uh, started to become a consultant, accidental consultant, uh, and, and found myself, um, of all things, uh, consulting for uh, Songbird Hearing, which goes way, way back when they came out with a disposable hearing aid. Yeah. Um, spent a few months there with the conclusion was that the, the model was flawed. Uh, but it was the great choice. disruptor at the time, right? Everybody said this is going to transform hearing care. But it, uh, well, it, it really, it, 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 you know, you have to champ, you have to have disruption in, in industries and, and in fields. It, it, otherwise, you're going to be sort of anchored to some, some past convention. You've got to continually challenge yourself. Sure. It was a really interesting product, and it was really um, well funded. Um, it's just that they didn't really understand how that product would be used. Um, the other thing is, uh, they're great laboratories for sound that are very good at amplification. And I learned that there's a difference between uh, amplification versus signal processing. Right. And I think that was where some of the downfalls came. But suffice it to say, was exposed to a variety of different uh, opportunities as a consultant and was presented with one at GN store in order, a Danish company that not only has hearing aids, Resound, as well as Beltone, but in addition to that, they own uh, Chabra. And that's really where I began my career. And then um, really just have always spent time understanding how does a market work from the end user perspective through intermediaries such as yourself, and what does that ultimately mean? Well, that's and great. Doing it. And so let's talk a little bit about market trends. Where where do you see things are right now? Yeah, well, it, there's a lot going on, to say the least. I mean, you've got one trend right now, and I'll refer to the traditional hearing aid market as RX hearing aids. And now you have this new thing called OTC hearing aids. That's one trend. We're seeing another trend of increased insurance coverage. And what does that mean in terms? of the market. And then you also have some major population changes that are going on that are, to me, 
the most important trend, and that is in 19 or in 2000, there were 32 million people over the age of 65. Right. There will be 72 million people over the age of 65 by 2030. Right. That's a lot of people. It is. Okay? As a baby boomer, uh, part of that group, um, it, it was always about time. We always wondered when it was going to happen, and it's happening now, right? At the same time, with improvements in products, we're seeing higher levels of adoption rates. So historically, you know, we hear 30%. Well, in the U.S. in 2022, is 42.5%. So when you mean that, you mean 42.5% of people who would benefit from hearing, hearing technology have it? Yeah. Still a lot of room to improve, and, and that's part of the challenge, right? What's interesting is in Denmark, where you can get hearing aids for free, their adoption rate is 53%. So Yeah, even- it's an interesting trend. I mean, you know, one of the big pushes for the OTC was that cost was an issue. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, cost is not an is not not an issue, yeah. but I don't believe it's the barrier personally. And and I think the data you're quoting shows that, right? So yeah. if yeah. if we were, were you know, I mean, uh the numbers are always in, in terms of disparity between free places and pay places, right. it's about five percent. And yeah. so it, maybe those five percent are the price sensitive, but uh of that really um maybe 80% of that group of adopters, yeah. price doesn't seem to make a difference. No, I mean, you know, OTC was based on three things, price, access, and awareness and education. Yeah. Um, that I'm not last sure if one, this is the last two, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, so so one of the things that I, 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 I'm the uh, chairperson for the Market Insights Committee of the Hearing Industries Association. So we're responsible right. for capturing information on end users and patients. Sure. And one of the things that was quite interesting is we asked questions to people who have identified themselves as having the hearing loss, but not having corrected it or, or augmented it. And we said, well, how comfortable with, how, how are you looking at OTC? And then generally, well, it's something to consider. Well, how comfortable are you at administering, self-administering a hearing evaluation? And I was quite astounded by the percentage that I need help. I need help. Well, it's a mystery in and of itself. In other words, you're typically willing to self-administer something that you have a lot of knowledge about, right? right? In other words, so I don't know if you are, you know, you know the risks and benefits of taking acetaminophen, which is just Tylenol, then you will likely self-administer because you don't think self-administration has high risk. But when you don't know what the risks are, I I can understand consumer hesitancy. And then, then probably the biggest obstacle is which product should I try? Mm-hmm. And and this has been a real gap. It, it's something that I actually am working on in, in, in my spare time is how do you compare one product versus another? The end user is looking for somebody to shepherd them through the process. Right. And they want to hear what the differences are between product A and product B. But if you go into a retail environment, a big box, and you see that you have a choice of 12 different OTC hearing aids, and you have no one to, that can help you identify, Paralysis. and then you pick one because, well, I've heard the name before. The One of the big challenges with OTC right now is, one, the return rate. They're extraordinarily high, again, because the end user needs some help. And so for and, the listeners, um, we consider return rate a mm-hmm. reflection of satisfaction. Obviously, if yep. you don't return it, you're satisfied. And if you do return it, you're not satisfied. So right. I'm sorry, Keith, go ahead. It, and it's big. It, 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 the number How is- How big? North of, north of 30%. Wow. Um, it, it, and, it, and in some cases, even higher. Uh, and, when, and I, I, the other comment I would say is, is those are returners yeah. rather than non-wearers, right? Yeah. And so- uh, probably a percentage of them don't return it, kind of say, well, that's the cost of doing business. And then it yeah. ends up in a dust heap with all of the other electronics. Right. Well, except now when you look at a number of the products, they're at north of $800 for a pair of these. So th- that becomes a very real cost. And so you'll right. kind of have people return higher price products. Get the money than, back, yeah. 
you know, I some uh, another retailer had made a comment that at thirty nine ninety five for a pair of personal sound amplifiers, the, the product that preceded OTC, they said we never got returns. Oh, for thirty nine dollars, their while people didn't want. No, to I mean, you shifted the cost of gas. It's probably going to cost you more just to return it. And the time in line, and yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so you know, there, there, there's some missteps here. Um, and then you've got some of the traditional manufacturers of hearing aids that really don't believe in the concept of OTC. Yeah. There are several manufacturers that that do believe that it's an important uh, offering and, and are offering it. Um, and so, but. But we're just at the beginning. It, it hasn't delivered to the promise that everybody thought, or the um, disaster that everybody thought. Right, right. and so so the sky I mean, did not fall. Well, no, I I heard the sun came up in the east today. I I mean, well, I, I I you know Keith, you know what my analogy is Y two K. So when for the people who are <laughs> you, you know old enough to know when the year two thousand came, there was this whole concept that like. The computers were going to melt down. The whole infor information technology infrastructure, like we were going to come to a screeching halt. And I actually have, for, I know people who are like banking gold and silver and putting provisions. I mean, yeah. you know, and it happened without a blip. Yeah. I think I, I, they're a little bit that way too. I remember it well. I mean, you know, um, you know, we were told that, uh, to have our, our cell phones ready in the event that they, the, the computer was a complete meltdown. Right. You know, everybody at Bausch & Lomb is holding their breath at 12.01 to see <laughs> if we're in business. Um, uh, yeah, it was it was quite something. I, I, I can only imagine the billions of dollars preparing for something that sure. didn't happen. But, but I, yeah. I think in a lot of ways, the arrival of OTC was kind of the same for our little space of hearing loss. People thought that the sky yeah. was falling and the world was going to collapse yeah. and we're all here. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing. And it, while it's still early and there's still a lot to work on before it becomes a really established option, one of the other things I take a look at is in-office dispensing, remote fitting, and self-fitting. Sure. And when you look at self-fitting and remote fitting, the mean and median age of that end user is considerably younger. I'd expect so. And the established traditional RX hearing aid. It, to the tune that I think it's 53 for remote fitting and 41 uh, plus or minus a year uh, on self-fitting. That's in the other mean. Word, yeah, in other words... Um, wow having these different options are attracting more people into getting some form of amplification to aid in their hearing. Right. Many from of them a, are pre-users. From right? a population point of view, there are many fewer people who are 41 with hearing loss than there right. are 55. And there are many fewer 55-year-olds yeah. than there are 70-year-olds. So even though your percentage, your distribution of adoption is there, yeah. It really skews to a uh, population that has a lower incidence. Absolutely. But this is all part of it. It's the it's same way the that we... Right. Insurance. Insurance has attracted uh, individuals to to um, uh, do something about their hearing. So, so it's about having more options that ultimately is going to attract more people. And if it all works to plan, you're going to hear better. You're going to be able to socially engage better. And we know that loneliness over the age of 70 is a, a real consideration and can shorten sure. one's life expectancy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 66 and change. And one of the things that I've done in my quote unquote retirement is I spend an hour to an hour and a half each day on cognition. It could be wordle. It can be crossword puzzles. It, it, I, how do you keep your brain elastic and active and sure. part of it requires you've got to be able to hear so i you know i i think that what's encouraging is the fact that there are these new means by which to get amplification and you know with that comes new people into the fold you know now all of a sudden the discussion is on situational challenges right, right. going into a restaurant i have difficulty going into a large meeting and so now they're, they're with, with products such as OTC, 
now all of a sudden becomes viable to do something about it that fits to the needs of that end user. And, and it, it, we're just at the beginning of this. Um, you know, we expect disruption to happen an awful lot faster than it happens. I'll give you the example. Um, I was mentored by the, the former head of Kodak uh, Consumer Imaging uh, right. Division, and I was a Sony Mavica. And East Mid Kodak immediately went, holy cow, we got to do something because our estimates say that by 1987, digital photography will eclipse chemical. And they hustled and they hustled and they brought in en electronic engineers. And all of a sudden, the trajectory is not going with the way that they thought. And so 1987 passes and it's not even close to eclipsing chemical. It was 2005 that it eventually did. So well, that's shame. That means Kodak knew it was coming and then fumbled knew. the ball of uh, running with the ball because their timing was. But there were a variety of challenges. Let's put it this way. There was a lot of money in film, chemical processing and paper. And, um, you know, digital did more than just simply disrupt. It eliminated. Uh, I mean, it eliminated it all. Um, and, and with that had other challenges. But the point being is, when you look at major changes, it just doesn't happen as quickly as you think. Sure. Right? I'll give you an example. There's some new technology that's going to be introduced. I think it's, all, I know one manufacturer has it. I think another will have it very, very shortly. So there's a new standard around Bluetooth. It's called Bluetooth LE. It, it essentially reduces the power drain required to, for various components for you to so work. Increased battery life. The simple. Hopefully it means less lithium ion in the hearing, right? Right. Um, but with that um, comes a new concept called AuraCast, A-U-R-A cast. And this is going to enable a hearing aid wear to easily plug into a, a, a television, and, and it would have to be a new television with AuraCast, but you literally could go went to a bar and said, listen, I really want to listen to that game. And you see, oh, it's on my, my app. I'd like to listen to the game. You could be in an airport where gate 74 mic is in effect linked to your hearing aid. So you won't miss the boarding information. So, so this it's is kind of the next generation people, uh, if they haven't tried it, there have been some products where they advertise to a certain radio frequency yeah. locally and you put your... Uh, Walkman or whatever the device on that radio frequency, and then they yeah. transmit you. So it's something like that, but of a little yeah. different. And it's ubiquitous. A, and one question about that: How will it have different signals? Like, so if you're in a sports bar, and yeah. there's, uh, you know, typically on an NFL day, there's yeah. five games going on. Right. How does that work? Um, don't the, know. The easiest answer to give you is I don't know. Fair um, but but um, I believe that each device will have an identifier. Uh, uh, so you basically say, I want to listen to that TV. Uh, right. That's cool. Right. You don't have to, you don't have to download a, 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 you know, an app, app like Trinity. Right. 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 So this is going to make it more ubiquitous. So if you mm -hmm. go into a church, you know, that if they have the right technology and here's the thing the the Oracast technology, the Bluetooth LE technology actually reduces cost of goods. So it's in manufacturer's best interest for television consumer sure. electronics to move in. I don't know how fast it's going to happen. I think it's going to be a little bit faster than maybe we've seen in the past. But well, certainly cool. our, our benefit, I believe, Keith, has been the cell phone industry. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the adoption and change has been directly related to the fact that people are changing or upgrading every three years. And so, yeah. you know, the particular use case you're talking about is public places, right? So yeah. I think looping is amazing. Yeah. But if people understand the concept of looping, it's much easier to put a loop in a new build than it is an old build. And so yeah. that makes a certain resistance to looping places, although I think looping is great. And so this is a yeah. this solves this problem. It'll just mean people will need new technology of transmission yeah. and reception. That's wonderful. It's really yeah, awesome. I mean that it, you know, and there's um, and, and there's now greater distinction between you know, uh, you know, knowing what noise sounds like, right? The different you, the, the ability to hear in, in loud situations 
you try to create a bigger uh, differential between speech and, and, and negate the noise. And all the manufacturers are getting much better at that. And sure, so sure. in turn, technologies are improving the experience to the tune that patient satisfaction for newer hearing aids are well above 86%. And so with higher levels of satisfaction, what's also going to happen, at least for the professional community, is that where that patient is going to be interested in future technologies because, one, they're wearing their hearing aid, they're hearing better, they're engaged, and the fact is, it's only things are getting better. There's more functionality. Rechargeability was something that sure. you know we've been working for forever. Now we have it. So all of a sudden, the impediments of wearing devices they, they're getting knocked down. And you know, yeah, thank no, God I, for you know earbuds. No, I, I think right? it's amazing. And, and so you know, uh, people might not be familiar with this. I know you are, Keith. But you know, so what happened was we had replaceable batteries where you had to put the little disc in and then we had rechargeable batteries that would go in the same slot that the replaceable batteries were and yep. now we have intrinsic batteries and so that was one of the bigger consumer complaints and especially as you get older your yeah. vision gets worse your dexterity gets worse so putting these little 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 chiclet batteries into hearing aids was an arduous task so i yeah, agree and so these are the things days. they're they're teeny tiny Right. And so these are amazingly uh, iterative improvements, I think, in terms of getting the um, uh, uh, the thing. And so how about like on the retail practice side? What, what do you see yep. happening? You know, so this is with the intermediaries who are the yeah. between between the hearing aid and the patient. Yeah, um, there, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, uh, you know, the cost of education is causing some of the problems. Sure. Um, if, if you are looking to study as an A and get your AUD degree, which is a PhD degree, oh, right? Um, you know that that could be as much as three hundred thousand dollars. Sure. And so, um, and this is a big challenge, even in MBA school. I, I just I've got some uh, recent uh, experiences with it. You know, when when schools are that expensive, all of a sudden you say, "Well, I want a job in marketing." Well, you can't justify a three hundred thousand dollar investment. And get it back. You're going to be paying. Yeah, just simply not going to get it. So the second so mortgage. There's some of that. Now. Yeah. So so there, there's the number of of individuals graduating with an AUD degree today is half of what it was in two thousand seven. Okay, and so you know there is going to be a shortage. If you believe that, look at we're going from thirty-two million to seventy-two million, or thirty-five million to uh, seventy-two million people over sixty-five, and you've got fifteen, sixteen million happy wearers of hearing aids that will want replacements in the future, and you've got OTC, and now you've got insurance, which is attracting more patients. Um, the challenge will be how do we how do we deal with that that demand, right? with fewer, if you will, professional intermediaries. And so I think there's going to be some real pressure put on how do we, how quickly can we evaluate one's hearing loss and, and how quickly can we ultimately then tailor the solution? And so um, I've done some studies on for some people, you know, it can take about an hour and 40 minutes from the time of filling out the paperwork and eventually leaving with a pair of hearing aids that have been programmed to your loss. The challenge is going to be, how do we get that down in 45 minutes? We're going to have to find alternative ways in order to accommodate, again, higher demand. But there will be a lot more demand. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that they're still going to need some shepherding and some professional counseling to figure out what product is right for them. This is, again, o the fallacy with OTC is that somebody's going to feel fully confident in being able to select something and self-medicate, if you will. And I think that's 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 going to be the real challenge. So, yeah, there's a little bit of headwind, but I would just as soon have and see that headwind than the fact that nobody wants tearing aids, nobody wants to um, go through the process. It's quite the opposite, um, and and I think that's encouraging. 
No, I, I agree. And so I, this is uh, great stuff, Keith. I, I really appreciate your expertise and uh, yeah. insight. So wh where do you see it? All right. So, you know, I mean, I know it's it's a yeah. you weren't given a crystal ball in college, but uh, where do you see it five years from now? Um, I, I think we're going to see um, I, I do think we're going to see a different protocol in evaluating hearing that um, AI um, is um, an area we were literally going through it with 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 with, with a, somebody who's looking at her into the space. You know how much information can we capture on prospective wearers of hearing aids that we can get into predictive situations where you say, "Listen, when when you hear these three uh, pure tones, um, there's a good bet that this person is heading in that direction versus another direction." You're going to start to see some of that. Uh, I think that's going to be a real uh, big plus um, it, because again, it's how do you, how do we, I, I equate it to you back in the, in the seventies, the Boeing 727, you needed three people to fly the plane. One of it was some guy flicking the, 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 the dials to make sure that you could communicate. Well, all of a sudden you don't need that type of individual, right? That's what's gotta happen. There's, there's gotta be an alternative view of how do we evaluate hearing loss? And then more important, turn it into then the dispensing of care. Um, I think you're going to start to see, um, you know, we, we hear about sensors in hearing aids. And um, there there certainly are is a school of thought that it, because, because of the proximity of, of a hearing aid to the body, that you can also get involved with other forms of healthcare or wellness. And, and there's truth to that. And I think you'll see some products uh, and you do see some products today that accommodate it but i think really where sensors are going to become more important is the ability to identify where the sound is coming from the sure. specific sound you want to hear and then adjust them back. how you turn how you turn your head so um there's a lot of microprocessing going on in hearing it i mean um uh one of the interesting concerns that my former employer had in selling hearing aids in Russia at the time of the Ukraine war was they were concerned that the Russians were just going to break open all the hearing aids and use the, their, their stacked microchips in a hearing aid right. with all the processing. And they were going to use those for their own uh, military use. Um, there's a lot of computing power in hearing aid today. And sure. I think it will continue. That's great. So Keith, what, what's your favorite sound? The ocean. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I had a, a, a commitment 36 years ago that our forever home, our retirement home was going to be in the, at East Hampton, New York. Uh, we made it here about a year and a half ago. Uh, after this podcast, we still have whales out in our ocean. I'm probably going to go out and take a look at them eating their, their mid afternoon snack, but I just love the ocean. It just, it, it just pacifies me. That, that, that is great. And Keith, if people wanted to get a hold of you, um, you know, for everybody, this is Keith Lewis. He's a yeah. consultant in the business and marketing space. How would they get a hold of you, Keith? Yes. Um, K Lewis, L E W I S, at submersive.ai, S I M M E R S I V E dot AI. That's great. Keith, thank you so much. It's been really great for you to share your insights and your experience um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know some of the uh, insider knowledge that you have. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your insights on the hearing space. Great. I appreciate the time. Good to see Thanks you again. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.